the, the Rocky Mountain MS Center has a specific approach to multiple sclerosis, which is actually unique in the world. And we know it's unique because all of us travel around and lecture, and uh, most other physicians are rather surprised by what we do. But there's a rationale for what we do that is very important, and I, I want to cover that rationale with you. I've mentioned it before in previous talks, but I think it is the single most important principle to understand about multiple sclerosis that then sets up what our treatment goals are. So these are my disclosures. I do consult and work with a lot of different companies, and if you have any questions about this and how we do this, feel free to talk to us about it. So the issue is um, that in the past, we have separated multiple sclerosis into three different types, or sometimes four. Relapse and remitting MS, primary progressive MS, secondary progressive MS, and sometimes called progressive relapsing MS. Because of that, we have ended up developing drugs in only one of these subgroups, as though these groups are biologically distinct. The fact is, they're not. Uh, there's a lot of debate about this, and there are very strong opinions in the field that says that they are, but when you step back and look at all the data, it turns out the vast majority of patients in any one of these categories seem to have the same disease. And the issue is, um, if it's the same disease, what does that mean for us? And so I'm going to go over that today. So the first off, this is a pattern for different types of multiple sclerosis. So this would be a pattern for relapse and remitting where you have an attack and then you're stable between attacks and then you have another relapse and ultimately you may begin progressing. This is just another case of the same thing. This is a patient who never really had a, a true relapse the way we define it and just started into the progressive phase right from the beginning. This is a patient who also started with progressive disease from the beginning but then ultimately had a relapse. And it turns out that about one third of people who start out this way will end up having a relapse. And it turns out that about 15% of all patients that have MS will start out with progressive form, and 85% will start out with relapsing form. Now, right now, we tend to separate patients into these categories, and what I'm telling you, or going to tell you, is that that does no longer makes sense, and that there's a different approach that we need to take to managing MS. So at first, a little bit of background about why these patterns exist, why they look different and act different, even though they're really not fundamentally different. So if you look at the treatment patterns in the United States, the fact is, Many of these patients are being treated with therapies that are not FDA approved for their particular form of MS. Essentially all therapies are approved for relapse and remitting, but very few are approved for the progressive forms. Nevertheless, people are on them. But if you look at this pattern, it's essentially random. What we would like to do is introduce a real rationale behind selecting therapies for patients in these different categories. So the evidence that these are the same disease, I'm just going to go over very briefly. First off, it was assumed that there would be genetic differences between these forms of the disease. However, recently a number of very large studies have been done looking at the genes that influence the disease of MS, and it turns out there are no genetic differences between progressive forms and relapsing forms of MS. Also Dr. Ebers in a, a family uh, history study showed that within families that have multiple affected individuals, the probability of any one of those patients having a progressive form of MS is exactly the same as it is for the overall population. So there are no familial differences. And more recently, there were two review papers published that were charged with reviewing the literature to argue about the pathological differences between these different forms of MS, but both of these pathologists concluded that there were no pathological differences between progressive and relapsing forms of MS. Also, there are many immunological studies uh, that compare these diseases. There's actually 36 studies in the literature now that argue that they're different. However, not a single one of these papers actually uh, reproduced the results of any other ones. In other words, in science, for something to be true, it needs to be confirmed in more than one laboratory. That has never happened in terms of the immunological differences between multiple sclerosis. In addition, these studies are seriously flawed because they don't have the right comparison groups. The issue here is that the patients that they study that had relapsing forms of MS are much younger than the patients that have secondary progressive form. And I'm going to tell you why that's a very important issue and that they can't really do these studies unless they control for age. So in order to go back and understand then why these forms of the disease seem to act differently even when we treat them with highly effective therapies, there's some other observations that you need to understand. The first is, is that MS is not a disease of myelin. It's a disease of the brain, optic nerves, and spinal cord, and it attacks all components of those structures. So it's a, it's a disease of the central nervous system, and it affects neurons just as much as it does myelin-forming cells. Also, the relapses that we count represent only the tip of the iceberg of the actual inflammatory disease that's going on. If you do MRIs every month on patients and then follow them clinically, for every relapse that they have, they will have 10 to 20 new MRI lesions forming. 
So the vast majority of the disease, 90 to 95%, is clinically silent. You don't know that it's happening. It's like hardening of the arteries. You don't know it until it affects a critical process, like blood supply to your heart or your brain. Also, uh, the probability of moving from the relapsing form of the disease into the progressive form of the disease is related to age and to the amount of brain substance that you might have lost. So this disease causes the brain to lose neurons. When the brain loses neurons, it gets smaller. It shrinks. That's atrophy. Now, the fact is, all of us will develop some loss of brain cells as we go through life, and all of our brains will shrink slightly from their maximum size around age six. Um, and that's normal. And the body has a certain capacity to mask that, and I'll come back to that. So in thinking about therapy, though, it is important to recognize that the vast majority of the, uh, of the disease is subclinical. So you don't treat the patient the way they look in front of you. You treat what, what's going to happen to them over a lifetime. And what the MRI does is it helps you estimate that risk of lifelong disability. That's why the MRI is so important. So this is actually not a trivial issue. There are physicians out there that would say you don't go from a early, uh, mild, safe therapy to a more aggressive therapy until the patient demonstrates that they're going to get into trouble by developing more disability. But in fact, that's letting the horse out of the barn, because by the time you develop that disability, we can't go back and reverse it. And that disability is resulting from many new lesions forming in the brain. So the reason that the brain is able to mask this disease activity is because, in fact, it has a number of uh, skills, of uh, capabilities where it can repair itself. It can rewire. It can remyelinate. It can even make new neurons in certain parts of the brain. So it has a certain capacity to, com to uh, compensate for injury. But there is a model here that is, is really important for you to understand, and there's another scenario where this is relevant. For those of you who watch football know that the National Football League right now is dealing with the problem of closed head injury and the impact that that has on players as they age. So players uh, playing professional football have high impact uh, uh, head injury, uh, concussions. They recover afterwards, they're able to go back and play, and they look essentially normal. The reason they look essentially normal is because they have reserve capacity, and they're using that reserve capacity to mask that injury. But unfortunately, for many of them, when they hit their late 40s and early 50s, they begin to experience memory problems, personality change, and increasing disability. And that's a reflection at that point, they've run out of that reserve capacity, and now just normal aging is going to cause them to lose function on a year-to-year -year basis. And that same thing happens in MS. So if we allow the disease to be active in early life and we don't treat it effectively, then what we're doing is we're trading off that patient's late life and their ability to function normally. So we would argue at the Rockmine MS Center that our therapeutic goal is to help every MS patient be the functional, happy grandparent that they want to be. That's our goal. So even if you're only 20 years old, we're going to be thinking about where you're going to be at when you're a grandparent. Now, a little bit of uh, data to go back. First off is that most of my colleagues in the world think of MS as a disease of myelin, not as a disease of the neurons or the gray matter. This is a pathological paper from Claudia Luganetti. Looking at brain biopsies that were done in MS patients, uh, we do occasionally have problems making the diagnosis, as Dr. Alvarez mentioned. Sometimes it's challenging, and sometimes we need to do a brain biopsy to clarify whether it's an infection or whether it's a tumor versus MS. And so she, Dr. Lucanetti collected these from around the world. She had about 60 of them, and she evaluated them all very carefully. What she shows here is that these are um, dying neurons. They're called pycnotic nuclei, and they represent neurons in gray matter that was just accidentally captured as part of the biopsy. They were not intending to do this. But it shows that the very first attack, because this is when the patient presented with their very first event, um, the very beginning of the disease, there's already neurons that are dying. And over here, they're being re removed by phagocytic cells, so little garbage men that uh, man the brain. Also, if we look at the size of the brain, which is a reflection of how many neurons people have, so patients, when they first present with their first attack, already have brains that are somewhat smaller than they should be. That's the CIS, is clinical isolated syndrome, so that's the very first event of MS. And these patients already have lost some brain substance, and that's a reflection of that preclinical disease activity that may have been going on for years to decades before they actually end up getting a diagnosis. And that continues as they have more relapses. So this issue of brain atrophy is actually occurring right at the beginning. Now, the reason I'm making this point is because most of your physicians think that this begins at the onset of progressive disease. It doesn't. It's there at the very beginning. So the loss of brain substance, the loss of neurons, or neurodegeneration, the term that we use in the field, is not the explanation for progressive MS because it's already there at the relapse and remitting stage. This is just to point out that as patients go through life, they have fewer inflammatory events and fewer relapses. 
So on this uh, graph, we're plotting them as a function of how long people have had MS. The longer they have MS, the fewer attacks they have. This is plotting by age, and it suggests that people that are in their 20s and 30s have the highest frequency of relapses, and this is the same for the MRI. They have the most MRI lesions forming, and as they go through life, the relapses fall off to maybe 25 to 30 percent of what they were here. And it turns out that many patients that are in that uh, 60 years of age uh, range or above actually have no active inflammation. This uh, uh, graph here is just a pathological study of brains that were donated for research purposes that had MS and, and they were compared to healthy age match controls. And basically what it shows is that inflammation is the cause, cause of the loss of neurons. So this is measuring a protein from neurons called amyloid precursor protein. And this is a marker for the immune system. And it just shows that when you have inflammation, you have more evidence that neurons are being damaged. But also, if you look at the inflammation as a function of age, it's decreasing. And that in some patients, when they're in their 60s and 70s, they don't have any active inflammation left in their brain. And the rate of neurons at that age that are dying is the same as it is in age, uh, age match healthy controls. So the point of this is, is that their MS is not two separate diseases, although it's often argued that it is. It is one disease, it's driven by inflammation, and shutting off inflammation protects neurons and allows your, your brain to age normally. This is just to point out that if we do allow the brain to lose neurons early in life, then it makes it more likely patients are going to have increased disability over time. And in this graph, we're just taking patients and we're categorizing them into four groups based on how large their brain is. So these are patients with normal-sized brains. These are patients that have the smallest brain. And it just points out that if your brain is smaller, you're about four times more likely to develop disability over a two-year period of time than if your brain is normal-sized. So preserving brain volume is actually the key therapeutic goal, and that is the Rocky Mountain MSers approach. We compare the therapies based on how well they preserve your brain volume. So to get back to this, so again, this issue here is, uh, this slide I showed you earlier is that patients look like they're stable between relapses, and I've told you that they're not. And the question is, is why do they look stable? Well, they look stable from this uh, slide that you saw before from Dr. Miravalli. This is a functional MRI. It's a way to look to see what parts of the brain are activated when you're doing a certain task. And it's actually measuring the amount of oxygen that's left in the blood as it goes through the tissue. This is a normal healthy control person over here. She's tapping a regular rhythm in the MRI machine. And these colored areas of the brain are the areas that are activated while she's tapping that rhythm. This also is a young woman who happens to have MS. She did have an attack who affected that hand. Now she's fully recovered from that, and she has normal neurological exam. But when she's in the MRI machine tapping, uh, doing that tapping test, she's actually using more of her cortex. That's called cortical remodeling or rewiring, and that's the major mechanism the brain uses to recover from injury and also to recover from neurons that we normally lose just as part of being alive. This is a very powerful way for the brain to recover function. Having said that, all NIH-funded studies right now on reparative therapies in MS are focused on remyelination. There are none that are focused on enhancing cortical remodeling, which is actually quite doable, theoretically. And so one of the things that we would like to see is that the reparative world begin to think about how to induce the brain to make uh, new connections as another strategy to help patients with MS recover function. This is just an example of a patient that uh, were undergoing cognitive training, so they were having trouble with memory, so they went through an exercise program to improve their memory, and they did so, and that improvement of memory was associated by using more cortex. So you can actively induce your brain to rewire by being physically and intellectually active. In fact, that is a very important strategy in multiple sclerosis. And so when we suggest that you exercise, it's not a trivial recommendation. It's based on biology that says if you exercise, you will increase the number of connections between your neurons. That will give your brain more flexibility to shift function around, and it gives you the better chance of recovering function and mask uh, the underlying disease uh, injury. We know that patients have the ability to recover because when we put patients in a highly effective therapy, such as Tasabri, this is natalizumab and Tasabri, the same thing, and we follow groups of patients over a period of two to three years, on average, patients with relapse-remitting MS on Tasabri are actually getting better in multiple symptoms. They report less fatigue. They report better memory and cognitive function. They report better upper extremity function. They can walk farther. Even their ability to be employed improves as a group. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody in that group gets better, but it means the majority do, and the means are improving. So the point of this is the brain has substantial ability to repair itself. The key, though, is to shut off the inflammation that's damaging the brain. 
because there's a race going on between the MS pathology that's damaging the brain and taking away function and the brain's ability to repair that. If we shut off that inflammation, then the reparative mechanisms have a chance to become apparent and actually improve function over time. Exercise has been proven over and over and over again to be effective in MS. This isn't a debatable point. This is hard scientific evidence that exercise is the single most effective reparative therapy that we currently have. That's why we want you to exercise as part of your overall treatment of MS. So the concept behind this that I'm going to uh, talk to you about is a concept that I, uh, like all my colleagues, travel around the world lecturing other neurologists on. I was just in Kyoto, Japan the week before last lecturing on this, and I go back to Tokyo again next month or a month after that to do the same thing. This is an international issue, but this concept of brain reserve is relatively unique to the Rocky Mountain MS Center. But the concept is what we need to understand if we want to maximize long-term outcomes. So this is the concept that actually comes out of the Alzheimer's literature. In the Alzheimer's world, they noted for a number of years that patients who had higher levels of education developed symptoms of dementia later in life than patients who had less, lower levels of education. And that concept came out to be called cognitive reserve. And ultimately, they understood the biology of this, and that is that if you're intellectually active and physically active, you're actually making more connections between the nerve cells that you have. So you can think of it as a, a matrix, a, a network. And expanding that network and expanding the connections gives your brain, brain more capability of shifting function from areas that's not working well to areas that are. It's much like the electrical grid that we have in the United States. It is a matrix, and if it weren't for that, we would have a lot more power outages than we do. But right now, we have a lot of different ways that power can get into any given city, and that has uh, really stabilized the power grid, and the same thing is true for the brain. So this concept of cognitive reserve um, is referring to that portion of your reserve capacity that you can induce, that you have control over. The brain also has a, a built-in capacity uh, for reserve, and that's called brain reserve. And I'm just going to use those two terms together now. I'm not going to separate them. So brain reserve is determined by genetic factors. It's determined by uh, in utero health, uh, how good nutrition was. It's determined by early life activities. So if there are things that damage and remove cognitive or brain reserve. You can place football in this box here. And there are things that enhance reserve function, and that's being physically active and intellectually active. There are uh, things that protect uh, from loss of brain reserve. Uh, there are drugs now that we think might be able to do that as well. But the point is, is when you run out of reserve function, then you develop symptoms. We know some of the biology behind this and it includes uh, many different uh, functions that are normal to the brain. And we also know that it's relevant to MS. So this is a study where they're looking at the size of the brain on this side and they're comparing it to how well people perform on certain cognitive tests. And they can show that the bigger your brain is, the better you perform on those tests. Also, when they look at patients that have multiple sclerosis and they classify them into those that have a relatively small number of MS lesions in the brain versus a larger number of MS lesions in the brain, patients who have bigger brains have less change in function even though they have more damage from the MS compared to patients who have smaller brains. Now, to show that this is also something that you have control over, they then stratified patients based on how active they were in their leisure activities. Did they go to the theater? Did they volunteer? Did they exercise? Did they get out of the house? All of those things increase cognitive reserve. And what they showed was that MS patients that, had, that were more active had better cognitive function. So early life activities improves the ability of the brain to compensate for MS, and that also was demonstrated when they stratified them again based on how much MS they had. The patients with more MS lesions of the brain who were more, more active had less symptoms as a result. So this concept of brain reserve is an important one. And the point of it is, is that when you run out of this brain reserve, that's when the progressive phase of the disease stops. So what we want to do is to minimize brain volume loss and keep you as far away from that edge as we possibly can. And that is actually a very new and very controversial concept, although the data, I believe, is really quite strong in supporting it. We did a study in MS patients, uh, Dr. Schwartz and I, along with other colleagues, and we basically looked to see if current activity in terms of how active you are now was important, or was it more important to be active in early life? And it turns out that it's how active you are now. So in this radar graph, the closer you are to the center, the more normal you are. And the patients who are active now were able to improve their function in essentially all domains. So it's not just cognition. It's in upper extremity function, mobility, pain, sensory function, uh, vision, et cetera. Essentially, all symptoms of MS can be uh, decreased somewhat and masked 
by simply being physically and intellectually active and building that cognitive reserve. So this is a model that I use to sort of explain that. The MS is actually one disease. Um, the issue is, is whether we happen to catch you with a relapse or we miss all the relapses and we catch you out here, in which case you would be diagnosed as primary progressive MS. The ratio of these MRI lesions to the relapses is somewhere between 10 to 20 to 1. So you get 10 to 20 more MRI lesions for every relapse that you have. And as a result, the brain is physically shrinking. That's this red line here. It's getting smaller all the way from the beginning. The inflammation uh, is decreasing as a function of age. It goes down and eventually stops in many patients. This brings up the issue whether patients who have been stable and are in their 60s, do they still need to be on these uh, disease-modifying therapies? The answer is probably not, and Dr. Corboy is leading an effort to try to uh, identify biomarkers that allow us to identify those kinds of patients. Uh, this is just to emphasize that if we don't treat early, we miss an opportunity to maximize function. So this is a study where they used a newer drug called alemtuzumab, which probably could be approved around the first of the year in the United States. Uh, this is a uh, drug that you get IV infusions, you get five in a row, then you wait a year and you get three more infusions the next year. And what this shows is that it works in both progressive forms, which is the light pink here on my slide, and, and it works in relapses. So this is the pretreatment phase. On treatment, the patient with the relapsing disease actually got better. They decreased their disability scores. The patient with progressive disease didn't get better, but they slowed down dramatically the rate at which they were getting worse, and they maintained that effect throughout the next three years whereas the patients with relapsing actually continue to get a little bit better each year for the next three years. So the point is, is that progressive disease is treatable. It's just that our expectations are different because of the loss of that brain reserve. So physicians need to understand that, that there is a reason to treat patients that have progressive disease. That's to minimize any further inflammation, any further damage to the brain. And then we're working on therapies now that we hope will induce repair and help patients with progressive disease actually recover function. There are stem cell therapies, there's um, there are antibody studies, and there are other therapies coming along that we think may ultimately help with that. So this is the way that we rate uh, the drugs uh, in our clinic. Uh, we look at their effect on brain atrophy. Uh, Nanolizumab is tosabri, omtuzumab, fingolimod, gelenia uh, are the more effective therapies along with tecfidera or dimethyl fumarate. The other drugs down here are less effective. In fact, the interferons have almost no effect on brain atrophy which is why we don't use them very much. And in fact, these drugs that are at the top here are not necessarily more dangerous. As was mentioned by Dr. Alvarez and Dr. Miravalli, it's a matter of selecting the patient for the drug. So if your physician does a good job of understanding your overall biology and understands the risks of these therapies, they can select a drug for you that gives you the least amount of risk but the maximum chance of preventing any further brain damage. This is how we rank them at the recommended MS Center. This is a consensus statement. All of us as physicians and care providers get together, we review the data, we come up with standards for how we treat patients. This is just one example. We have this for people who have diabetes, we have another ranking for people that have high blood pressure, another ranking for people that have other disorders. And the reason is, is because those other illnesses affect uh, the risks of these particular therapies. Also, the other reason that we uh, talk about exercise and diet is that if you develop other diseases, such as obesity, hypertension, diabetes, that actually dramatically increases your risk of having disability due to MS. So just having one other diagnosis here, I'm sorry, one of the diagnoses increases your risk of having disability by about 50%. If you have three other diagnoses, like diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity, your risk of disability is increased by a factor of four. Those are very large effects in medicine. So, uh, there are no specific MS diets, uh, however, we do have some reason to believe that vitamin D uh, is probably important to supplement to try to keep you in the normal range. We'd like to have you in the upper half of the normal range. We have not yet proven that that actually changes the course of MS, but a number of studies have demonstrated that people with low vitamin D levels are more likely to have attacks and more likely to have active MRIs. There is no special MS diet, but there are healthy diets, and we would urge you to talk with your uh, clinicians about what a healthy diet would be for you, and there are some factors that affect that. It's, and the main goal of diet is to provide good health and minimize the chance of any diet-related diseases. So I'd like to switch gears here for just a couple minutes and just tell you about some of the research that's going on at the Reichmann MS Center, headed up by Dr. Uh, Jackson and Dr. Yu. So we have been very interested in trying to get a model of an MS patient's brain in the Petri dish so we could study how their immune system works with that. And the traditional way of doing that is brain biopsy. 
unfortunately, they don't let us do that very often in the clinic anymore. So we have to develop some other strategy. And the problem in this area is that there is something unique in the MS patient's brain that's not there in patients who don't have MS. So we actually do need neural cells from MS patients' brains. So, the, so we're, how we're going to get them is we're going to get them from the urine. I'm going to skip these things. So what we do, the study is um, we're developing a technique uh, that's in called inducible pluripotent stem cell technique. So we can actually isolate cells from people's urine that are normally shed uh, from the kidney. And those cells can be treated with genetic factors and turned back into stem cells. And these are genetically identical to, to the patient now, so they match that patient. We can then treat those with other genetic factors and turn them into brain cells. So now we do have a bit of brain in the petri dish from culturing these urine cells. And now we can go back to that same patient and take a blood sample and ask exactly how their immune system and their brain cells are talking to each other because that's the key. In MS, there's a, something wrong going on in that conversation that leads to the inflammation. This is now, I think, the first time that we actually have a model that we'll be able to actually figure out what that is, which will help us a great deal as we move forward with therapies. In addition, this is actually just pictures of cells. This is a, on the, the side is this is the initial urine culture, and these are the cells after they've grown for about two weeks in the Petri dish. And these are, uh, these clumps down here are uh, stem cells that are forming. So the other project is try to develop a vaccine. Uh, this is using an animal model of MS called EAE. And uh, Dr. Jackson has made significant process, uh, progress in this. So this is just a slide showing that we can treat with a, a vaccine uh, using a protein that is not a part of the disease process, and yet it can downregulate the inflammation in the brain. It's called bystander immunosuppression. So we are making a lot of progress. Um, we have a very large group within the Rock Mountain MS Center, uh, including the program at KDEP and the hydrotherapy and uh, other programs that we've got. Uh, the program really is, is remarkable. It's grown dramatically over the last few years. I expect it to continue to grow and develop, and I think that I'm working with one of the top teams in the world. Thank you very much. Thank you.